<laughs> and we are recording. So on the line is the mad and completely illustrious Andrew Smith. Um, I, uh, he's already just cracked a joke right now. We're both having a little personal joke at each other, which is fantastic. That's the way it's always been in our paragliding community in South Africa. Uh, I would like to introduce a man who's been number one in the world who's broke several world records. Uh, he's not doing yes, he's crying out to himself. And uh, Andrew has a lot of great stories and lots of great lessons to teach us. Um, I've asked to, him just to squeeze out a couple of his best of, which is very hard to do because there's lots of best of. Um, Andrew, early in his uh, flying career, was the first man ever to fly a 200 kilometer flight when he crushed the record of Xavier uh, Ramon, who had set it in um, Namibia. And uh, he brought it to South Africa, beating it and crushing it from 165 kilometers to 241 Ks. Um, he has uh, won a PWC in Portugal on a serial glider. That's to really show the guys. That was in the year 2000. Lots of records, lots of fun with Alex Lowe, who lots of people may know have uh, as a, an APCO um, a test pilot and a very close friend. But of course, Andrew has been on the South African um, uh, national paragliding teams for many, many years. Many people will know him from world championships. But competition flying is not his only thing in his life. Um, Andrew has been extremely successful as a, um, a businessman, um, starting banks, having gold mines, and the rest. What I like most about you, Andrew, is that you're a really modest, down-to-earth, we-can-talk-to-you kind of guy. You don't have your nose in the air. You don't look down at people. You take every single person for a fellow human being. And I have to say that that kind of ability, that kind of approachability makes you a really fine gentleman. Welcome on the podcast. Thank you very much for accepting. And um, I want to also say, without kissing your ass, because I've done lots of that in the past when I was a young squirt and you were my idol. Well, you still are one of my idols, but um, uh, you have taught me some of the most important lessons in paragliding. Two of those is get high, stay high, in the paragliding sense, of course. And the second one is Thanks for being here. Hey, Steph. I don't know who, at least you've got the portable view. I've got you to look at, man. <laughs> for you, man. But, uh, uh, I mean, generous words, kind words. Thanks, Steph. Yeah, I mean, it's um, paragliding has probably given me over my lifetime more fun, more enjoyment, and more exhilaration than anything is imaginable. It should be illegal, it shouldn't be allowed. It's too good. Too good. And it still it still stays this good, you know. We've been flying for what? What's I can't even count from the eighties, huh? Eh? Thirty mm -hmm. more than thirty years, and it's still fantastic. Right now, today we locked down from from the virus. Uh, right now, we could be thermaling with um, the Cape vultures, which live here, flying a hundred k triangle, no problem. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful stuff. But as you say, lots has changed, man. Lots has changed since we started. When we started in the beginning, what what I gave give you advice? Get high, stay high. Big thing is you've got to be able to thermal efficiently. So you've got to be able to climb fast. You've got to be able to climb in anything. You've got to climb anywhere, and then you can make all the decisions. It's all yours to make. Um, these days, the, it's completely different from when we started. The fields are very fast. Um, everyone knows the route to fly. There's no, there's no imagination. There's no, <laughs> there's no, there's no, or not. There's no. There's there's very little adventure um, as we used to have it in the big competitions we were completely out of our depth we had no clue which way to go which side of the valley to fly where to go how high to go when to leave and it was a learning experience fantastic all the time mm -hmm. yeah a, a lot of things have changed in competition flying of course one of the themes that we're talking about in today's po podcast is how paragliding has evolved in 30 years and i'm sure you will testify to how sh how horrible the <laughs> We're back then. Carry on, please, Andrew. It's all about you. Uh, you've got the uh, you've got the exact word horrible. The gliders were horrible, Steph. You would fly along, minding your own business, perfectly responsibly, thinking about your next turn point, whatever it is. Boom, your glider's gone, and it's in a ball underneath you, and it's going past you, and there's like uh, uh, twenty seconds of mayhem, and then you fly again, and you couldn't feel it coming. You had no idea why it collapsed. There was no reason. There wasn't particularly turbulent. <laughs> So there was a lot of terror in those days, man. 
Uh, now the gliders uh, are fantastic. Every glider, the gliders are are beautiful. Huh? Fast, safe. I mean, they handle beautifully. They launch properly. Oh, all good. Yeah, I mean, today's gliders, as you like to tell us at competitions, hey, listen, guys, I'm getting a bit older. Although you don't look old at all, Andrew, you look really good. You look really, really fit for a 75-year-old. I have to say you look uh, fantastic. So, listen, dude. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, of course, every pilot, when you ask them, will know what was their horror glider. What was the cuckest glider you've ever owned? The shittest machine that you would have happily given away. I, I'm just trying to think if the manufacturer still, exi manufacturer still exists so they won't sue me. But it was probably the Firebird Cult. That was a scary monster. It oh, had yeah. two. We've got two lines these days, but that time it only had two lines the other way around. Oh. <laughs> so when the glider went, it could make a knot. And the reputation was if the glider collapsed, you had to throw your back up. No, it was scary stuff. Oh, yeah. There's something you throw your reserves straight away. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, what can you do here? Oh, wonderful. Ah, it's such a delight to listen to you. Hey, what a pleasure. <laughs> and of course. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, now, you've got a really funny story to tell me, and that's about uh, um, one of the records, one of the many, many records that you've broken um, would be a tandem record that I mentioned uh, just briefly with Honor uh, Hamar, who I had on the line yesterday. I was relating your story of tandem because he really loves flying tandem. He's the first youngster, and I think he was 26 or something years old, when he flew 400 plus kilometers, Andrew, on a tandem. Wow. So. Yeah. And he's talking um, uh, in the interview with him yesterday, he's talking to me about 500 completely attainable, 500 on a tandem, I mean, yeah. and he's talking about 650 on a solo glider now. And he's not speaking it like he's blowing smoke out of his ass. He's talking really it. So Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Ted, we, we, we had so much fun going for distance flying. It became more of the, the fun rather than the records because Let's face it, you can fly for weeks and months without getting a record. You can fly for years without getting a record, but you're flying every day, so you have fun. And we, in those days, the world record was only sort of about 300 Ks, and we were averaging 200 Ks a day for the whole season. It was fantastic. But we went yeah. for, a, we for a tandem record, and the, the British the brothers were, had the record. And um, I was alternating between passengers. And my, my latest passenger, my friend's wife at that, that stage was a tall girl and the harness wasn't set up. So we had to take off land. You know, this is in strong conditions. They're all, all ugly. Take off land, which costs like 10, 15 minutes, relaunch, climb out. And we go, as we climb out, as we climbing out. In those days, you had to take a picture of the ground with your camera and your wing and whatever. I say, okay, please take a picture of the airfield. She says, oh, I can't. I'm feeling sick. And you go, oh, no. We haven't even left the airfield. We're climbing out on a perfect day. Take the cameras, off we go. So she starts to vomit. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, it's a record day. We have to go. So we go. Da, 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 we push. So she starts to complain. She can't breathe. Now, I'm acclimatized by then. So you think, you know, we're going 14, 15, 16,000 foot. It's not so high. She'll be fine. Anyway, keep climbing. She goes to sleep. Now, when your passenger, a large passenger hanging out of the harnesses, it's difficult. Anyway, so we continue. Every time we go down, she wakes up. And then she complains that she, you know, that she can't breathe, which I didn't believe at that stage because you can't really hurt yourself for a quick ascent to 16 or 18,000 foot, whatever it is. Anyway, mm -hmm. long story short, we continue. So eventually I have to switch the vario off because every time she hears it, the vario making a noise, she knows we're going up. And then stop turning and just fly big patterns. But it is a pumping day, Steph. Seven, eight, nine meters, two base. It's fantastic. And we're just going. And my yeah. girlfriend is on crew. So I say, look, uh, my passenger's sick. We're going to have to come and land. And we push, push as fast as we can. And we're getting close to the ground. She said, no, you can't land here. It's too dangerous, too dangerous, too many dusties. Up we go again. <laughs> so we just played along. And this poor girl, uh, she was unconscious most of the flight. She was cold, unconscious. And we just missed the world record by a few Ks. And <laughs> shame. She could never read in a car again. She could read in a car before that, but she got so air sick. And it turns out she was asthmatic and couldn't breathe. Oh, I felt pretty bad about that. But anyway.
It's a great flight. <laughs> like you mean it. Like you feel bad about that, but actually. Oh, yeah, it's it's like... one, six. But what do you do? It's a record day. It's a record day. You must go. Uh... Our related tandem story when the people on the mountain come to us and say, oh, do you fly with uh, uh, anybody like my size, you know, and a largest guy will go and uh, uh, will, will show me his stomach. And I say, of course, we fly with you know, 130, 140 kilo, kilogram passengers. We don't care. Bring it on. As long as the wind is good. No problem. Two year old kids, you know, handicapped people, blind people, deaf people. Bring it on. It doesn't matter. And what I feel like saying to them is actually you're all just bloody ballast. So it doesn't really matter at all. <laughs> I try to, I, my, um, he's currently, but not for very much longer, my brother-in-law, the guy who in fact taught me to fly, Andy de Klerk, the fantastic oh. mountain, South African mountaineer. He brought a okay. glider back in the 80s from Chamonix, and we used to jump off, I mean, the first flights were jumping off Lion's Head and Table Mountain, it was lovely. And so he, we were out here, and we, he wanted to uh, jump his wingsuit from our tandem. It's not a strong day we climb, we get up towards base, it's a strong day, sevens and eights. And um, he gets out of his, he gets out of the harness to zip up his wingsuit and the, I've lost you, there, yeah. No, yeah. He gets out of the harness and the harness turns over, you know, as a tandem harness turns over, but he's a strong guy. So he's hanging facing me now, um, hanging on the, on the, on the, on the, on the spreader. We lock legs and now he's trying to do up his wingsuit. He can't get his wingsuit done up. Can't get back to the harness. He's out. He can't deploy his parachute because his wingsuit, someone knotted it on behind him on takeoff. So on a stonking day, he's got to hang on and we've got to fly down to the ground. Oh, you can cause a lot of trouble in tandem. It's lovely stuff. Whoa. I'm glad I wasn't Andy. But, you know, actually, if I look at him, I can see why he's gotten a bit older. Maybe that very, very moment was it. Uh... Yeah, if yeah, you, I agree. If you're going to be in trouble with someone, that he's the guy you want to be in trouble with, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, very yeah. Cool. Yeah. Andrew, I'd like you to uh, let's go a little bit to the topic that we agreed on. What do you see? Speak of some milestones. Speak of some uh, things that have happened in the last 30 years in glider development. How have gliders developed? What have you seen as big jumps? What have you seen as saviors? What have, have you seen as waste of times? Please. I, th I mean, so the, some of the biggest development has been in the in the knowledge base in the sport. So everyone knows more. Everyone's cleverer. The gliders have got better. So it means you don't have to launch in Portable at two o'clock in the afternoon when the wind is 40 k's an hour and get blown down the ridge. You can actually take off in the morning, have a good flight. You can work lighter thermals. So the knowledge base means that everyone knows the plan better. Everyone knows how the thermals work, where to go. So the, the entire fields in these competitions are better. Everyone can fly better. And never mind the gliders. Okay. And then if you just, we'll get onto the gliders, but if you go into the competition side, the electronic instruments make it all fantastic, Steph. The, the, the nightmares about proving where you were, how high you were, if it was a cloud issue, taking off, crossing the line, finish, all of that stuff has gone away. Mm -hmm. Remember, the old competitions were ground starts, eh? I mean, do you remember how many people, how, how much effort was required for the organizing committee or the organizers to take those form roles, keep them in people's names, in envelopes, off to the developers, sitting hours at night going through people's cuck photos because they couldn't fly with one hand and take a photo with the other. Um, what a shocker, man. What a pleasure today. Hey? So yeah. instruments is what you said. And, and I mean, if you see, go yeah. on. And the stress levels are down for the competitors. So a, a competition is a stressful time for most people anyway, especially for the people who are less experienced. And now with an air start, everyone's a bit more relaxed. There's no pressure on the launch. Those days there were ground starts. So in a world championships or something, the whole field was launching when the hooter went. So now that, right. a couple of cascading events from that, that means if you want to do well in the competition, you had to get a good launch. If you wanted to get a good launch, it means you had to be on, this, on, the, on the launch early and laid out early. Now, the South African team, even though they were only weekend pilots, they were, wanted to be the best weekend pilots. So they were very keen. So we're up early, and this was in that big site in Spain in the Pyrenees. And laid out. Castro Juan de Sos. yeah. So at that stage, the South African team in that year was sponsored by ABCO. And remember, Abco gliders had had the um, lack of porosity with the with that uh, silicon layer. 
The South African team races up there early in the morning, lays the gliders out in this beautiful green lo- glass, grass, gets the prime or a good position. Only the Koreans or the Japanese beat us that, that day. We laid out, we're ready. Three hours later in the blazing sun, it's time for the, the race to start. Five, four, three, two, one, pop. The siren goes, 150 pilots pull up. No yeah. South African. The gliders were wet and had condensed because of the fabric. No one else's gliders had got it. No South African could launch. <laughs> oh, man. Stress levels. So that's the one thing. The stress has gone out of the competition. You launch when you like. You have a calm air start. You wait. Te- technically and tactically, it's much better than uh, yeah. literally fighting on the launch to get a launch. That's all good. That's all good. And the gliders. I, I can't say enough about the gliders, Steph. Please go on about them. Speak about gliders from 1980 sack when the dinosaurs were still roaming the earth till now. <laughs> There's one advantage in the old gliders. You could sleep inside them, huh? <laughs> inside the cells. <laughs> really, really want to go back to old times so that I can sleep uh, in a glider. nothing like. good about the... I can't say enough about the gliders. Every single glider is fantastic. They glide well. They're safe. The speed is is much higher. We can go further. You can you can fly into 10, 15 k an hour headwind and not notice it. You just fly. So push this no. little go fast thing, and your GPS is always saying 50 k an hour. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It's lovely. Mm. So, so, this is the big thing, huh? And we see it yeah. where we fly up, up here at, in in the high felt. You, I mean, you can make 100 k. Tri- Andre has been made like three, four hundred k triangles on just average days. Lovely stuff. Eh? Yeah, I, I'll be speaking to Andre Rensford Alberts in the next days. I mean, Andre is also one of our real cracks in South Africa. Russell Achterberger has also agreed to chat to me, and we're going to have a really, really nice in depth uh, one on one with those guys. I mean, how they do it. I mean, Russell and Andre are both absolute legends at showing the way, thinking their own think. Because, of course, uh, Andrew, and you'll agree with me that today in competition flying, a lot of guys will simply hang with a gaggle. It irritated my ass off two years ago here in, in South Africa at the Portable Comp. And just uh, six k's from goal, um, I landed uh, needing just literally 100 meters extra to make it. I, saw, um, I, was, I was in the group behind you that day. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. So we saw you. No, you, that was a fantastic day. Well, screaming words <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that is the thing. The, the tactics have changed. Everyone's got good gliders now. Everyone can fly properly. There's no, there's no adventure in the route finding. You have to be with the group, and you have to make your decision at the right time to go. That's what you've got to do. Or you must go in the yeah. beginning and be lucky and just push. But tactically, yeah. you know, you've got to, you can stay with everyone now. You've got to stay. Yeah, yeah I mean, you were in a task committee in South Africa every single year. You're known for that. Uh, I've been having the honor of joining you on that and uh, being – being next to you, learning from you, and obviously oft- often disagreeing with you and arguing with you, and then you saying, yeah, but think about this. And then Russell will come along and make the last word because he's got even another one up on us on in foresight and thinking. So yeah. um, really interesting to set such uh, tasks and things. If there are any pilots out there that are a little bit younger, like I know uh, we spoke of the get high, stay high, um, and uh, never use or never waste a thermal until you're at the top. Now, Andrew, those are two lessons that have really, really stayed with me. And I want to tell you that I've repeated them a couple of hundred times to kind of in my turn up and coming pilots. So, um, yeah, uh, just uh, evolve the subject, subject a little bit there for me, please. Yeah, so, I mean, Andre makes the point well, and I really think Andre is one of the fastest pilots in the world. And I remember we were in China. John Pendry made the point. China, you fly on a big cliff, strong lift, and it's almost – irresistible when you're a paraglider pilot. You're flying along and you get a 10-meter climb, you take it. Mm-hmm. If you're flying on a, on a ridge, if you slow down to take, a, take climb, a climb, you get behind. So that's the first real lesson of going fast. So the get high, stay high doesn't work if you're on a ridge, as we know from Portable or any of these big ridges. Because every time you stop to, to, to make height, you get behind. Um, the height gives you the ability to make the decisions and to decide what you want to do. In these days, races, uh, obviously, it depends on, on where the thermal's working. There are times when the middle section of the thermal is, is the strongest, and then you want to, to only use the fastest part of the climb. So let's say it's five meters in the middle, three meters low down, and two meters 
to the top as you get up, get up. You only want to take it to the top, to the top of the, the fastest part of the climb. If you can connect, if you can connect with the next climb, which is the big thing. The, it's the confidence knowing that you're going to connect to the next climb. Yeah, yeah. And then getting high and staying high. I mean, staying high, I repeat, is extremely imperative. When your feet are on the ground, the game is over. Competition, not competition, cross-country, free-flying. You know, the lift's closing in the Alps at uh, 5 p.m. and you go for a nice 4 p.m. flight and you think, oh, great, eh? the thermal's a little bit light, but I'll pick up the next one. You're on the ground at quarter past four. And you're thinking, oh, shit, I'm going to not make the last lift. Yeah. And that's my whole day. I've driven an hour and a half from Munich to get here. Um, yeah, your comments on that? Yeah, from, from that point of view, 100%. That must have been a really clever guy who said that to you. We, no. we, if you yeah. So, I mean, there are a couple of things that come with this. When we used to fly distant records or try and fly distance records, obviously, with much more height, you two things that work with you. The, the, there's normally a wind gradient with strengthening wind at altitude. And the air is thinner. When you get to 20, we were flying often at 6,000 meters. When the air is thinner, your effective ground speed is much higher and your tailwind is stronger. So there it was just a no-brainer. Um, I've seen a number of times guys leaving thermals when the thermal is really, or people leaving thermals when the thermal is really rough and difficult. And that's why I think one of the big lessons is you've got to be able to be completely confident in your glider to fly in the hardest conditions because sometimes you only get one chance. And you leave that thermal, and then you, you're getting further and further behind and lower and lower. So I'm still with that. Height is, height is what it's about. You can't, easy to give away height, not always easy to make it up. If you're yeah. climbing, you might as well stay with it unless you're in a competition. Eh? Yeah. And if I can add uh, to cross-country pilots or uh, any pilot for that matter, if you've just gotten your license, your A license, uh, your, uh, your ba basic or beginner license, or if you're in, uh, really fired up and keen on your first competition, really, really important is on your very first takeoff and your very first thermal, test how high it is. And all the way up on your very first test, all the way up, try to work out what the wind is actually doing, if you can. But stay in that thermal right up to the top. Even if you're starting to lose height, you can start to look at what the wind is doing from each angle. But you'll very quickly know it at certain heights, what the wind is actually doing one way or another. And that's the kind of information that be it free flying, cross country flying or competition flying, I think what's mega important is that we are, that we are um, uh, very conscious of what's going on, not just floating around like sheep. Eh? What do you say there, Andrew? Well, Steph, I say you've been the one of the leaders in uh, the ability to take off in the before a task, a window opens, take off, fly around, top land. Um, and most of the pilots are too tense to do that. Maybe they don't have your skills to top land, but they're too tense to do that. And what happens is that you're taking off and you're sampling that air. You're feeling where it's working, what's not working, and you know it very well. And that's a huge advantage, that knowledge um, – when when the when the task task opens, and one of the biggest advantages I think of of these air of air starts is we have them now in a competition. You've disappeared. Yeah, I'm here. One of the biggest one of the biggest advantages of of these air starts is it allows you to fly around for for an hour before the start and feel where the thermals are stronger, see what the wind's doing, see where the, the, where the, where the lapse rate is best or where the, where the, where the thermal is, goes to, a whole lot of things you can feel before the start. And I think that's, that makes the competitions much more satisfying. Yeah, um, I have to agree with you there, Andrew. I, I used to completely be like, oh, it's so stressful in the air trying to get up to the thermal to the top. Uh, 12 minutes, 11 and a half minutes, maximum 18 minutes before the uh, start take off and get into the air. And now I look back at that thinking and I think, what a, uh, what a chop. It's so easy to switch off your Bluetooth on your phone when you're floating around there, up, uh, up there in our current school gliders, how easy they are to fly, um, that we should be up there sucking in information um, in this day and age and, and uh, actually starting to, to really appreciate where the best spot is to leave the start cylinder, for example. Um, you might think, oh, yeah, on paper, it's this spot. But then you'll find a guy or two guys who are one kilometer more upwind and actually have a much, much better line than you. And it's too late when it's uh, two or three minutes to go um, for the task. Let, speak. let me test you. Let me ask you something, Steph. Um, do you think oh. you fly better intuitively or using your intellectual side of your conscious brain? 
Well, you see, if you have no brain, that's a very difficult question to answer. So, <laughs> so you know, you're a clever guy and you've come to me with a, with a big, big question like that. No, um, I think it's a combo of the two. I really do. I think uh, intuition is one thing. I mean, you know, 17,000 tandem flights, uh, uh, flying like, a, a, as you know, it's a take off and land and flip flops and whatever I'm flying in. That's all cool. But there is an intellect side that sooner or later, even to a guy like me, has to kind of kick in. What do you say to that? You answer your own question. We, we had a, with some of my Danish or Scandinavian friends, we had a really interesting debate about 10 or 20 years ago when a, a Norwegian philosopher brought out um, a book on the fraud of consciousness. And his entire sort of statement was that uh, your conscious bandwidth is very, very narrow. And one of the things you want to do in flying is, well, this is what we deduced, is you want to try and limit the interference of your conscious bandwidth. A hangover was good. My friend Jay would, would argue that a hangover is the best. Some guys listen to music. A toothache works. Anything that fills your conscious mind and distracts it allows you, to, scarily enough, allows you to fly a little bit better because you, now you, you assimilating all of the information that you, wouldn't, that you can't process in your, conscious, in your conscious mind and making a different decision. Very interesting. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I mean, you've hit the nail on the head when you say, uh, Tracy uh, would often say to me, listen, Steph, keep it tidy at a competition when I kiss her goodbye to say, I'm off for a week. And uh, on day one or day two, there I am with the inevitable hangover. And needless to say, that'll be the day that I will smoke everybody. And I am complaining bitterly or running around asking anyone for some headache tablets because I never carry any. I'm um, saying, oh, listen, I really need one. And I'm thinking, like, I'm going to have the doggest day today. And uh, there you go. You smoke everyone. And uh, you've actually hit the nail on the head with a kind of, if I may, distraction. Is that it? Uh, to, yeah, I, to I, that, that was our theory. And I mean, it's, I don't know if that still carries or what people are doing. But but you, your, con your unconscious mind absorbs far, far more information than your conscious mind. Your conscious mind will focus you on the turn point or what other people are doing and might distract you. Your subconscious mind will just let you fly, fly where the air's best. Very, very yeah, interesting. And I, yeah, and on that note, I'd, I'd also like to tell people in any kind of panic situation or when I, um, the very, very first podcast I did, Andrew, actually started as a, a kind of request from a youngster on, a, uh, on our Glen Paragliding Club in Cape Town. And he said to me, his name's Robert, and he said, uh, Steph, don't you want to say something to us? And I thought, what the hell? I've got lots to say. Let me send a little voice note. And it turned out to be a 15-minute voice note on a WhatsApp group. Um, and that was the beginning of like, oh, geez, we want more. And the weirdest thing is that my encouragement for doing these podcasts came from that youngster asking that question. And uh, about five hours later, I received a, qu uh, um, a question from Canada saying, hey, where can I find you online? Where These podcasts are so great. Uh, where do I find that stuff? You know. So it's like, uh, that's 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 really it. And I do uh, uh, reiterate in that very, very, very first podcast that I did um, uh, that it's really important to keep your cool and to be able to manage something like panic. Um, either you need to do three SIV courses a year if you're that kind of person, because we're obviously all not, we are not all the same, or you need to obviously be one of those people that has just a five minute meditation and he's cool. Yeah. What do you say there, Andrew? Yeah, panic's important. I mean, you see it when when you're getting you've you've arrived at goal in a strong day, a really strong day. Um, the dusties are firing, the wind is gusting at 50 k's an hour. It's all ugly, and you know you've just got to you can't throw your glider down onto the ground and force it down. You just got to wait. You'll get down. And I think that I don't know if someone told me that or I worked that out myself, but it's a big lesson on a really tough day. You just cruise around. You'll get down, no problem. You won't get blown away. And you, people are, you know, really trying to force their gliders down. And some of the guys I spoke to are really stressed one of these competitions. And it's just had a chill. It's all the gliders fly, no problem. Yeah, and even out of a competition situation, I think that holds a lot of water. I mean, a lot of people see a thunderstorm developing and free flying recently in Kaifenberg in uh, in Austria at Almberg Al Alm. I see uh, guys uh, battling to come down. The sky is turning blacker and blacker. But uh, they start. Then you see the more and more and more panic start to kick in. Bad idea. Yeah, it's very look. I think there's a lot of experience. We've been flying for a long time. We've flown around thunderstorms for a long time. I'm. Um, very, very, very respectful of 
of thunderstorms. But I think what we see here, so we, we've been flying in the same place for a long time, so we know the, the, the conditions well, and it's the time it takes the clouds to develop. There are days when it can OD in 15 minutes. I mean, I'll, just as an aside, I think my, my, my fastest 200 Ks was one hour, 59 minutes. And that's going what? some. Yeah, one hour, 59. What? Repeat that, your fastest what? 200 Ks was one hour, 59. My and girlfriend I didn't speak to you. Yeah. Position one said 101 Ks in the hour once uh, in one hour, 59. You did double of that. Yeah. Oof. But at that stage, you assume you're going to die. So the, yeah. the sky, the sky over, overdeveloped so fast, you can't get down. The wind was 106 on the ground. Ah, st well, ah, terrible. But I think that's where the experience comes in, that you, you want to see how fast the day is developing. And some days, there's me small and medium-sized CBs you can fly around. If you know which way the gust front's going to be, you can, you can manage it. But when the whole day is popping quickly, that, the, those days don't leave me with much uh, uh, <laughs> happiness. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you've got the old and the bold pilots. Now, Andrew, you don't only fly a paraglider. You also fly a little jolly airplane around. What gives yeah. you great joy? Or am I asking a stupid question? Uh, what gives me greater joy? I mean, you've flown all sorts of airplanes. You've, how yeah. many planes have you? No, no, no. I've, only, uh, I've got, I've got a, a little four-seater. Um, it, it's still flying. It's really nice. It's flying, but uh, it's transport. So it you feel very clever when you fly your little plane from Joburg to Cape Town or you get through, you know, you do something, but I don't like um, getting my thrills out of flying a, flying a small fixed wing plane. I think that's, it's more for secure transport than for excitement. Yeah. But it's, yeah. it's very clever. You put your paraglider in the back, you can go fly somewhere. It's all good. Yeah. Now you've been flying over 30 years, so you've got lots of, uh, and back to the theme of the development of paragliders, you've got lots of things that you've, obviously thought out about where paragliding could go. Where can it go, Andrew? Sure. Every year it gets better, faster, further. Um, the nature's changed. The nature of the, of the competition sports changed. Um, and it's just, it's, that's, just, that's just a fact of life. Um, I, 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 like the, I, I like the hike and fly stuff that the guys are doing. I, I don't, unfortunately, I lost my, my hiking and capability in a paragliding accident a few years ago. <laughs> um, but the hike and fly is great. The competitions are great. Um, I, I'm not quite sure where it ends up now because you go to a competition, they, their pilots are flying for the, in the first competition, their pilots have been flying for 30 years. There's a massive skill difference and a massive difference in the gliders. So probably you need to be more serious, take the, the different levels more seriously. You know, Formula, mm. Formula 3, Formula 1, whatever it is, rather than um, have everyone in the same competition where the guy's always coming last. That's really interesting, yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, uh, if you think that the top B gliders in the B category today would smoke anything that you were flying 10 years ago is uh, kind of weird, you know? Um, yeah. uh, so that says a lot about uh, a lot. And um, uh, Zaid from uh, Dust of the Universe, who I just listened to a podcast by a few days ago. I mean, this guy reckons uh, he's in he's in Lebanon. I don't know if you know him, but he basically tests any single glider. He just gets any glider in his hands. And I overheard him saying he's he's tested 180 different paraglider models. I mean, wow. that's a lot of. That's a lot of gliders to try. So you really can compare apples and apples on that one. And he actually reckoned that there's very little difference uh, between um, a B and a D glider today. And the difference in safety or if you are not wide awake doesn't warrant the one or the other. What do you say to that one? There's, a, there's still a big difference between the comp gliders and the, the triple C gliders and the, the D, Cs and Ds. And you see it when yeah. you fly... Um, with your friends into wind in or difficult difficult legs, the the top end gliders are just that much better. I actually have to disagree with you on that, uh, Andrew. You and I are I'm flying triple uh, C or D gliders, and we're having a jaw on them, and we're feeling fine, and we're all good. But um, I think that if we actually in real times measure what a pilot of our standards flying a C glider would make as a time difference to get to goal, it would actually be 
on the bigger scale of things, quite small, don't you think? Depends on the on the environment. If it's portable, Steph, may, and you've got a lot of downwind legs, maybe um, mm -hmm. flying big yeah. triangles to wind. That's where you feel. That's where you feel the difference. I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I did. Obviously. I, just, I did break my own rules and allow myself to get a, a triple C glider again. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> Tell us what you are up to. Have you pre-ordered something? No, no, no. I got a, I got one last year. Oh, what? When is it? Yeah, late. Whatever. I've got a lovely, lovely triple C. Fantastic. So fast. It's ridiculous. Tell us what it is. It's a UP Guru. Yeah. Lovely. Oh, great. Guru. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, Very uh, who did that? I can't remember. A few days ago, I podcasted somebody who was just saying how beautifully the Guru turns, um, as opposed to a kind of several. It was Philippe uh, Brewers, the photographer from the PWC. And yeah. he was saying, and in his Belgian accent, uh, you know, these most of these CCC gliders, they have to turn in steps. You're like, turn, turn, yeah, turn, yeah. turn, and then you go yeah. for a turn. You know? And he said, the guru, oh, one thing that's really above is its hand. Two, two things. The handling's fantastic. It launches just like a paraglider, like paragliders mm. used to, but it's very, very fast. <laughs> very, very fast. Lovely. Lovely. Mm -hmm. Fly everywhere at 50. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just, yeah, you know, no, definitely. Just push the <laughs> half the speed by, just fly right. Just lovely. And your Zeno is for sale. Anybody need a good deal on a Zeno? You can contact uh, Andrew for sure. <laughs> uh, nice one. Uh, mate, it was you that long ago, um, Andre mentioned to me on the phone yesterday, uh, that uh, predicted that serial gliders would get nearly as good as CCC gliders um, in the shortest time with this whole story of change of homologation and throwing out a prototype. So, Oh, what do you have any comment on design oh. on on the past and uh, future? Yeah, look, the the, the competition gliders um, are better uh, tested these days. Um, when I when I was injured quite badly, I went to a, a serial class glider. And the serial there was a, still a big gap, but what one of the re my reasons for going to a serial class glider was that as a weekend pilot from the southern tip of Africa, you couldn't access the top end. Um, gliders so they were for the test pilots and for the team pilots were mainly European or, or Asian test pilots and team pilots so if you went to the competition and were competing in the open class you didn't have a glider that could you didn't have a current glider you were always a year behind and the team pilots had better gliders so it was a no-brainer for me a being injured and b wanting to being seriously seriously wanting to compete I went to serial class because that way I could compete like for like Mm -hmm. That was the thinking behind that move. So now I think two things have happened. The gap has narrowed a little bit, not completely, but a little bit. Um, but the triple C or the triple C gliders have got more rigorous testing. So it's not a just a free fall. So the gliders mm -hmm. are properly tested. Um, I don't know. I'm very happy with the safety level at, at the triple C's now. That's for sure. I mean, uh, in a way, it's really comforting to know that you can go to a competition and no one's going to, well, there's a very small chance that somebody's going to have a bad one or die, you know. Um, obviously, uh, and I don't want to speak out of context, but it can happen that somebody's a little bit too enthusiastic and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the thing can still go. But to fly the modern gliders that we're flying is a absolute pleasure isn't it yeah it's it's an it's an honor it's just they're fantastic look paragliding does does seem to be dangerous there are lots of people get hurt and killed i've been hurt a few times and i think that's the nature of the sport you're flying around hanging underneath a bit of fabric <laughs> strong strong air conditions that's how it can be well andrew i'm going to send you a podcast from peter recek who started his paragliding company in uh, czech republic mac para in 1989 <laughs> A smuggled glider in communist times into Czechoslovakia. A beautiful story. And he reckons, hey guys, at the end of the day, what is it about? It's fun factor. It's about us having fun. And we need yeah. to not forget that we don't get a, a $10,000 of prize money for being first at anything in paragliding. You know, these very podcasts, I don't expect them to bring me one penny. If they do, as I said, uh, and I've put it on the blurb, uh, you know, each person who's enjoyed a podcast and thought that it's worth it put a dollar towards some zimbabweans who work for me and the money will go directly to them a little initiative a little something but uh, not why we do these things we paraglide for fun i do these podcasts for fun and it's all what it's about yeah
Uh, absolutely, Steph. You can't you can't say it strong enough. Every single time I fly, I enjoy it. And sometimes we have short flights. Sometimes we have long flights. Every single time, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely privileged to be able to fly a paraglider. It certainly is. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're getting to wrapping this up. I want you to tell me another quick funny story, Andrew. You've got plenty of them. Tell me another one of your experiences. Take your time and give a bad one. A funny story. Uh, there are too many funny stories there. Um, I don't know. <laughs> oh, Steph, no, there are too many stories now. Most of them involve you and, and what you were doing, you know? <laughs> No, true. Uh, no, no, no. I've been a good boy all my life. <laughs> do the people do the people who listen to these podcasts actually know who you are? I don't think so. I think they're all it, overseas people who see me as this and the scruffy guy. And I have to apologize to everybody. It's extremely hot and portable today. Uh, I mean, the weather is bloody beautiful. The wind's straight up the front. Um, I'm right at the takeoff uh, where I've got locked down in South Africa. But uh, actually, let's leave them. Let's not tell them. Do you want to say something about you? But, but do they do they know that you, the man who walked into a show? I don't know your normal entertainment show at a at a paragliding competition. Except you decided to walk into the room naked. That no, I don't remember when, that. When, you don't remember that. That's funny. I think all of the locals who try to throw us out of the out of the venue re remember that very well. Uh, was that at John uh, John Nicholas and Andrea's place uh, up there uh, near Nelsbright? Uh, Somewhere near there, Cops of Hope, yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's coming back to me. All it's right. Coming, uh, guys, it's uh, coming back to Steph that he might have scared an entire town away. <laughs> Listen, for $500, anyone can see me in that. <laughs> 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 and it's been really great carry on your wonderful life um, I'm sorry to take so much of your time and it's a real a pleasure to have your time um, Andrew's just going to sell a gold mine or buy one, I don't know, what's your, what's your next move? <laughs> Well, you know, if you if you try something for long enough, eventually it'll work for you, go for you and now the gold price is running, thank you very much so yeah. we might survive yeah yeah, well, I did a little move of buying a little bit of gold um, just before the lockdown was announced or when Ramaphosa yeah. made his first, I just sent my manager out to just go and get some gold for me, which I don't think is a stupid idea. Um, let's talk uh, politics or economics for a little bit. What does the future hold for the world? What does the future hold for South Africa, in your opinion, in the next months, years? Give us a... Well, I'm, ho I'm hoping that people will come out of this with a slightly more human air realizing some of the stuff that we're chasing is not worth it take it take themselves a bit more personally i don't know what the right expression is but but worry about other people a bit more not about um about possessions and material things and in south africa we are going to have to pull together extremely hard because the economy is going to be destroyed after this i mean we just had our little gold mine we you know obviously we're paying our workers but to when you can't to pay people, when you can't generate revenue, is very tough, and the whole yeah. country is struggling. Eh? No, absolutely. Uh, for economists that uh, Ian de Vries knows very well, um, uh, basically echoed that, uh, and they all agreed that uh, within two years we're looking at South Africa being in a situation like Zimbabwe. Um, the rand is uh, expected to free fall shortly. Um, huh, how do you feel about that? Do you agree with them or? Well, the rand has really taken a taken hit. It's going to take more of a hit. We've been down downgraded. Yeah, it's not going to get much better. Um, I think it's going to be tough times, and we're probably going to have a a really tough couple of years getting the economy back on back on the road globally and um, in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely going to be a setback in the economy in the world. I think it's going to be, as you say, uh, hopefully that people change their thinking a little bit. And I don't want to say the word capitalism as, a, a capitalism as opposed to a socialism, communism, Marxism, or whatever. But we have been thinking more and more and more. And we've been uh, kind of sucked into the selfie syndrome where we've got to be better than the Joneses. And, and I think that that kind of image is probably going to be having a very big change. I certainly hope it will go the right way with people. Um, but certainly it's going to be extremely testing times for us in the future. Yeah. You know, people are, I mean, I, my only hope is that people deal with each other better after this. Um, this is a, we are living right now in a global event, uh, presumably a once in a lifetime event, similar to one of the great wars or the flu epidemic. This is one of them. And we're in the middle of it right now. The latest news in South Africa is that the 
will hit peak infection in South Africa in September. So there's serious punishment to be taken still in South Africa. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I think, uh, you know, only uh, 52 people had died in South Africa from Corona yesterday, uh, that being the 17th today with the 18th of April, um, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, bloody scary to think when it actually gets going here in our country. Um, and people will come with all sorts of bullshit news and say, oh, um, I think you guys have missed the point. Uh, um, people in Africa have got extremely strong uh, immunes, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, I think that's absolute hogwash. I think that uh, immunity is immunity and humans are humans, yeah. Well, the thing is, with, with this virus, we, we haven't developed immunity yet. So it's, that's the reason it can take off so fast compared to a common flu. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a massive thing for the world. Yeah. And now I'm distracted past my telephone as you showed me the 300 vultures at your place a few minutes ago outside of your garden. I'm watching these crows cranking it up it's not it's strong funny. but it's be there yeah. oh bloody awesome as, uh, david elicini from uh the, from jack and jones the competition pilot uh from switzerland you see who he is the clean cut uh, 56 year old guy anyway uh, i had him on the line and he was like laughing saying sometimes i go to work in the morning and sometimes i go flying in the afternoon <laughs> i'm like that's nice yeah <laughs> it's been great andrew really really a pleasure i hope we do this again really soon and thanks uh, we will send it out to you it's going to be on spotify very soon and uh, on a youtube channel all of that kind of stuff i'll send you all the links no normally normally steph i say to my daughter um be bad cause trouble i won't i won't say that to you you manage that without advice <laughs> sorry, sorry what did you say <laughs> cheers man thanks sir Cheers, Andrew. Thank you very much. I'm just switching off the recording right here.